one of the main forms of cross-channel transportation between Britain and Europe, the Eurostar operation has been one steeped in turmoil due to vying political priorities and security concerns, the stringent regulations of the Channel Tunnel, and a difficult uphill battle against low-cost airlines that severely stunted its market share, especially for travellers outside London and the South East. However, during its turbulent early years, two proposals would come to signify how what was originally meant to be the crowning achievement of modern rail travel was cut down to size through compromise after compromise, while attempts to spread the Eurostar brand beyond its largely constrained UK market were curtailed through political obstacles and a lack of infrastructure that could truly make this system competitive. The Channel Tunnel project is a marvel of modern engineering, a 31-mile undersea rail tunnel that connects Folkestone in England with Calais in France and allows for direct train and car travel between the UK and Europe. With concepts as to a channel tunnel having gone back as far as 1802, ground was finally broken on the project in 1988 and would ultimately open in 1994, with car and truck carrying trains, originally known as the Le Shuttle service, immediately shaving up to an hour of the previous time taken to cross the English Channel by ferry. In 1990, British Rail founded a holding company known as European Passenger Services, or EPS, which was jointly owned by SNCF of France and SNCB of Belgium, and would oversee the operation of Eurostar, a dedicated intercity train that would run through the tunnel using high-speed express sets based on the underpinnings of the highly successful French TGV. Eurostar would be supported by the construction of dedicated high-speed routes either side of the Channel Tunnel including the 207-mile-long LGV Nord high-speed mainline from the tunnel portal at Calais to the northern suburbs of Paris that opened in 1993, and a 55-mile extension between Lille and Belgium in 1997 to connect with Brussels. Originally, plans were to create an equivalent on the English side of the channel, the alignment being from the tunnel portal at Dollins Moor near Folkestone to London Victoria via Tunbridge and Croydon. However, a largely anti-rail stance by the then Thatcher government meant that, as part of the 1987 Channel Tunnel Act, Section 42 of this document stipulated that the government would not fund or support the creation of a direct rail link between London and the tunnel portal. The result was Eurostar being forced to jostle for position among the highly congested commuter network of South London before ambling its way across the Kent countryside at a speed no greater than 100 miles an hour. Meanwhile, the northern platforms of London Waterloo, together with several sidings and the lift providing surface access to the Waterloo and City Underground Line, were torn down and replaced by a gigantic curving terminus station dubbed Waterloo International, a superb engineering feat that cost £120 million and was distinguishable by its blue steel barrel roof that stretched along the northern perimeter of the main station. At the same time, stringent safety legislation regarding the Channel Tunnel itself required that passenger trains be of a length no less than 1,200 feet, this being necessary so as to ensure that at least one part of the train would be near an emergency exit, connecting to the non-rail service tunnel between the two running lines. At the same time, consists had to be formed of half-sets in order to allow one half of the train to be uncoupled and safely exit the tunnel in the event of a failure. Aside from these restrictions negating the ability for the French TGV or German ICE to run through the tunnel to London, the resulting Class 373 Eurostar sets, at 18 cars and 1,270 feet in length, were among the longest passenger trains in Europe. The sheer size of these trains meant their ability to be operated across either the British or European rail networks was extremely limited, their underpinnings generally identical to that of the regular TGV, but with physical dimensions trimmed down to meet the restricted UK loading gauge. In the end, due to the length of the Eurostar trains, the initial trunk route between Britain and Europe only operated from London Waterloo to Paris Gare du Nord and Brussels Midi, while seasonal trains ran to marne le valais Chassy to connect with the new Disneyland Paris Resort, and winter-only trains travelled to Bourg Saint-Maurice in the French Alps for the popular skiing market. Regardless, EPS, beyond the Trunk 3 capital service, also planned to extend the reach of Eurostar further than London to major regional centres in England, Wales and Scotland giving rise to regional Eurostar, a daytime operation comprised of 14-car Class 373 sets and Nightstar, an overnight sleeping car service. Service patterns for the regional Eurostar would operate on both the west and east coast main lines, 
travelling to Manchester via Milton Keynes, Rugby, Stafford, Crewe and Stockport, while one train would be routed via the West Midlands, stopping at Coventry, Birmingham International, Birmingham New Street and Wolverhampton. On the East Coast, a service to Glasgow Central would run via the recently electrified main line, stopping at Peterborough, Newark, Doncaster, York, Darlington, Newcastle and Edinburgh. The service pattern comprising two trains per day to Manchester, one via Birmingham and one via the Trent Valley, while Glasgow would be served by one train per day, these trains not stopping at London Waterloo due to an unfavourable track arrangement and instead would continue directly to the Channel Tunnel. Instead, as these trains would be forced to avoid stopping directly at London, intermediate UK stations would be pick-up stops only for outbound trains and drop-off only for inbound trains, while UK border agency positions and segregated lounges would be fitted to the stations where regional Eurostar trains would call. These services would ultimately avoid the London terminals by way of the North and West London lines via Willesden and Kensington Olympia before joining the regular Eurostar route at Wandsworth, northeast of Clapham Junction. To operate the service, seven 14 car Class 373 sets were allocated to the regional pole, these trains being based at the main Eurostar depot at North Pole in West London, the existing Palmody Traction and Rolling Stock Maintenance Depot south of Glasgow, and the newly built depot on the approach to Manchester Piccadilly Station. The specially built International Depot in Manchester was constructed at Longside adjacent to the existing Motive Power Depot, and comprised of two stabling and two indoor maintenance roads being able to house up to four sets at one time, the total cost for EPS being £140 million of investment in trains and infrastructural upgrades to the UK network in order to accommodate the regional Eurostar services. The Night Star, meanwhile, was a logical continuation of the famous sleeping car trains that once crossed the channel via the Dover to Dunkirk train ferry, the most notable being the Night Ferry, which operated between 1937 and 1980, after which British Rail withdrew the service due to it being non-competitive with domestic airlines. The night ferry was complemented during its heyday by the iconic daytime Golden Arrow or Flesh Door, which operated between 1926 and 1972, though this required passengers to disembark the train at Dover before crossing the channel by ferry and boarding the second half of the service in Calais. At the same time, despite the rapid rise of high-speed rail travel in Europe, Overnight sleeping car trains between the continent's many regional centres and capitals were still popular, and the Night Star could have easily expanded these operations into the UK. Therefore, EPS, at the end of 1990, put out a tender for the construction of 200 carriages for overnight trains between Britain and Europe, with the outline specifications being to conform to the British loading gauge, designated C3, to be 23 metres in length, and to be capable of operating at 125 miles an hour. First-class compartments would have an ensuite toilet and shower, second-class compartments would only have a wash basin and a communal shower, coach cars would have 50 to 60 reclining seats, and there would also be a lounge car, a buffet, a luggage van, and staff accommodation, each train consisting of between six and eight carriages, with bidding for the construction contract to have concluded by the end of 1992. On February 4th of the same year, the Metropolitan Camel Company, or Metro Camel of Washwood Heath, Birmingham, was announced to have won the contract to build 139 cars at a total cost of £110 million, scheduled for delivery in July 1994, this contract comprising 47 seated cars, 72 sleeper cars and 20 service vehicles. In terms of service patterns, the Night Star would operate between several British regional centres and the European cities of Amsterdam, Cologne, Dortmund, Paris and Frankfurt, each destination being served by sections of trains that would split at Aix-la-Chapelle, or Aachen, on the Belgian-German border. On the UK side, the equivalent service would travel to Glasgow Central, Plymouth and Swansea, with all trains routed via Kensington Olympia in West London, Nightstar utilising the former motorrail sidings at Kensington in order to marshal individual sections of trains bound for different destinations in either Europe or the UK. In addition to service beyond London, some trains would terminate at London Waterloo Station, and comprised 16 cars working the core route to Paris, though due to axle weight restrictions on the LGV Nord, Nightstar trains were forbidden to operate on this route, and thus would be confined to the classic French main line via Arras and Longju near Amiens. As for haulage, the European side was an easy matter, as a majority of the French, Belgian, Dutch and German networks were electrified, 
therefore meaning appropriate locomotives from the passenger haulage pool could be drafted into work night star trains. On the UK side, as not all destinations were on the then limited electrified network, a mixture of classes had to be considered for both electric and diesel haulage, with the upcoming Class 92 being modified from freight only operation to mixed use, allowing it to be compatible with Nightstar stock. Meanwhile, 12 Class 37s were purchased from the trainload freight sector to haul Nightstar trains on non electrified routes. To comply with Channel Tunnel regulations, Class 92s hauling Nightstar trains between Britain and France would top and tail the consist to ensure at least one functioning locomotive would be able to haul the train out of the tunnel in the event of a breakdown. At the same time, due to the class not being compatible with the KVB signalling system used on the wider SNCF network, the locomotives would hand over and receive their trains from French BB36000 locomotives in the middle of the Fretern marshalling yard just beyond the tunnel portal. While EPS Class 37s were fitted with Electric Train Supply, or ETS, in order to make them compatible with passenger stock, this would not be enough to supply the Nightstar carriages. Therefore, 5X Intercity Mark III sleepers, made redundant due to the downturn in sleeping car services in the late 1980s, were converted for use as generator cars. Maintenance of the Nightstar sets would be undertaken at a variety of locations, with major overhauls being carried out alongside the Eurostar units at North Pole Depot in West London. North Pole would also serve as the maintenance point for sets working to Swansea, with empty Nightstar trains running the 210-mile journey from Wales to West London during the morning before running back again in the afternoon, maintenance for sets in Glasgow being undertaken at Palmer D alongside regular intercity stock working the West Coast service, while part of the Lera depot in Plymouth was fenced off to stop trespassers. However, before the deal between EPS and Metro Camel could be signed, the project was halted by the then European Commissioner, Leon Britton, who argued that the deal between the consortium members was anti-competitive, forcing EPS to allocate limited funds to Metro Camel to undertake indicative design work. The builder, however, very quickly burned through these funds, and thus all work regarding the project was halted until Britain's demand for representation from the consortium members had been met, whereupon approval was given on July 7, 1992, and the contract was finally signed although first delivery would now not take place until either late 1994 or early 1995. On November 14, 1994, regular international Eurostar services between London, Paris and Brussels commenced, bringing a huge amount of enthusiasm to the potential regional Eurostar and Nightstar operations, with EPS having a fixed asset value of £928 million. The honeymoon period for Eurostar rapidly waned, though, in the face of cracks appearing in the viability of the business case for not only the existing three capital service, but also the prospective regional Eurostar and Nightstar services. Regional Eurostar was in an especially precarious situation, as due to delays in testing the 14-car Class 373 sets, designated Class 373-3, one launch date after another was missed. This forced EPS to sublease several HST sets from the intercity cross-country pool to work what was unofficially known as the Eurostar Link, a shuttle service connecting Manchester Piccadilly and Edinburgh to London Waterloo from May 1995, working one train a day in either direction between the three cities Mondays to Saturdays. These trains would also stop at intermediate stations, including Milton Keynes and Stoke-on-Trent, as per the prospective service patterns of the upcoming regional Eurostar service, and only passengers with through Eurostar tickets could board but this meant that most trains would run at less than half full. The result was the eventual demise of the Link HST service in January 1997, after suffering sustained losses, with Eurostar instead offering discounts on regular intercity services out of London Euston. As British Rail underwent the turbulent process of privatisation in 1994, the government announced on November 11th of that year that EPS would be transferred to a private consortium called London and Continental Railways, or LNCR, a private property development company backed by the Department for Transport. On February 29, 1996, LNCR won a prospective bid in the upcoming Channel Tunnel Rail Link project to build and operate a proposed high-speed connection between London St Pancras and the Tunnel Portal, what is now known as High Speed 1, with the government also throwing in the ownership of EPS and the UK shares of the Eurostar company. This thereby transferred to their power all of the EPS physical assets, 
including Waterloo International Station, the North Pole and Manchester International Depots, 10 International Class 373 half-sets, 14 Regional Eurostar half-sets, 7 Class 92s and 12 Class 37s, as well as the upcoming Nightstar stock. Finally, in 1997, Regional Eurostars and Nightstar stock began tests in April of that year, with Regional Eurostar sets working between North Pole Depot and Manchester, while Nightstar coaches were tested between Carlisle and Carnforth on the West Coast main line, and Newcastle and Edinburgh on the East Coast. Problems once again surfaced, however, especially for the operation of the regional Eurostar sets on the West Coast main line, as despite their 186 mile an hour capabilities, the sheer power draw of these trains, rated at 16,000 horsepower, would cause power drops if they travelled above 110 miles an hour, or operated on both power cars, making them no better than the Class 86 and 87 electric locomotives already working between London and Manchester. To further compound the problems encountered during testing, the lack of providing a high-speed connection between London and the Channel Tunnel, as well as being only a viable alternative to domestic airlines for those living in South East England, meant that LNCR wasn't meeting its forecast passenger numbers, with the proposed break-even for Eurostar operations of 1997 being missed. The Eurostar company would ultimately not report its first year of profit until 2007, around the time that the long-awaited High Speed 1, together with the refurbished London St Pancras Terminal, became operational this having been helped along by the partial opening of HS1 between the tunnel and Forkham Junction from 2003, that allowed for a phased introduction of 186 mile an hour operations between London and Europe. The sustained losses incurred by LNCR meant that in May 1997, all testing for the Nightstar and regional Eurostar was halted, and the company struck a deal with the UK government to subcontract Eurostar operations via Eurostar UK to Intercapital and Regional Rail, or ICRR, the terms of which meant that ICRR could not run regional Eurostar services without government subsidy. With the DFT unwilling to support the scheme, Richard Branson's Virgin Rail Group stepped in and announced that they would run regional Eurostar services at its own risk, but this proposal was eventually dropped when Virgin decided the project could not be supported. In the end, on July 9, 1999, Nightstar and regional Eurostar were officially axed by LNCR, with the company having spent £300 million on new rolling stock and infrastructure to support both schemes, all of which had now gone to waste, the order for 139 Nightstar carriages having only ever seen 64 built, while there were also 14 regional Eurostar half-sets and dozens of electric and diesel locomotives now left without a purpose. Eventually, the Class 92s were put to work on regular freight traffic, until being stored in 2001, although some have seen a return to work after long periods of redundancy, now operating in their mixed-use capacity on the Caledonian sleeper between London and Scotland. Sadly, others have remained in storage after only five to six years of operation, and are now largely stripped for parts at various locations across the UK, having never recouped their £2 million per unit construction cost. The Class 37s, meanwhile, continued to work for EPS's rescue trains and to haul Eurostar sets, but these were eventually sold to Direct Rail Services, or DRS, to operate freight trains, with many examples still being regular performers upon the network after various upgrades. While it was expected that the specially built Nightstar coaching stock would never see work again, in June 2000, Via Rail, the National Passenger Operating Company of Canada, purchased three Nightstar coaches, testing them between Ottawa and Montreal during November of the same year behind one of the nation's famous LRC locomotives. Satisfied with the results of the test, VIA bought all existing vehicles, both complete and incomplete, for 125 million Canadian dollars, with all carriages shipped by October 2001 and entering service on June 23, 2002 under the Renaissance brand to work the ocean service between Montreal and Halifax. As for the purpose-built Manchester International Depot for regional Eurostars, this only ever housed one set in 1997 before being closed, with the brand new and barely used facility sitting inactive for the next 20 years, with only brief use being found to test Class 185 units in 2005. The depot would eventually be leased from LNCR by Spanish train manufacturer CAF in May 2018, in order to test brand new Mark V coaching stock and Class 397 EMUs for Transpennine Express, and after the end of use with CAF, the facility has been repurposed 
to house Northern Class 323 suburban units. Finally, for the 14 regional Eurostar Class 373 half sets, these were stored at North Pole Depot until May 2000, when, in order to cover a shortfall in their fleet of Class 91s, the private operator of the East Coast Main Line, GNER, leased four sets to work trains between London King's Cross and York. Dubbed the White Rose, these Eurostar sets operated nine journeys per day, Mondays to Fridays, and were maintained at North Pole, using the North London Line at the start and end of each day to reach the East Coast Main Line. The White Rose operations, though, were not without practical constraints, including an ever-present issue of severe power draw that limited them to a 110 mile an hour top speed, together with their slow door closing times and the fact that they could only use two platforms at London's King's Cross station due to their extreme length fouling the signals. Furthermore, the sets were barred from operating north of Darlington due to gauging issues on the King Edward VII Bridge in Newcastle, while their power draw precluded their use on the Hartford Loop Line via Bayford, which forms a common diversionary route, or on the line to Bradford Foster Square. However, despite these many operational issues, the White Rose service was expanded to include operations to Leeds from 2001, and would prove to be the closest these northern cities would get to a regional Eurostar service until December 10, 2005, when GNER, now with a fully refurbished fleet of Mark IV train sets and additional HSTs retired from Virgin Cross Country, chose not to extend its lease on the four sets and return them to LNCR. Eventually, after two years in storage at North Pole, LNCR sold these sets to SNCF, which would continue to see work on domestic French operations between Paris, Lille and Calais, as well as some trains to Bologna, until 2011, after which they were replaced by TGV duplex sets and put into store, bringing a premature end to these severely underused trains after a cumulative working career of only nine years. Overall, the fundamental flaw of the regional Eurostar and Nightstar operations were the lack of providing a high-speed rail connection, both between the Channel Tunnel in London and to destinations north of the capital, but also the stringent restrictions of tunnel regulation, the lengthy journey times, and the requirements of the UK Border Patrol. For the regional Eurostar, this project was doomed from the start, as journey times between Glasgow and Paris were expected to take over eight and a half hours making these operations non-competitive with domestic airlines and thus rendering their business case moot. The Night Star service, meanwhile, though illustrating some greater merits due to it providing a sustainable sleeping car train between Britain and Europe, was hampered by mounting costs and the financial instability of LNCR that dragged this scheme down too. These were compounded by the regulations of the UK Border Agency, which, unlike European international sleeping car trains, required full security and customs checkpoints to be established at a variety of stations across the European and British rail networks, a prospect that was costly and impossible to manage. While passenger numbers would likely have been low, the service, if not so stringent on security, could have had the same potential as many other European and British sleeping car services, such as the night jet trains or the Caledonian sleeper, but instead was doomed to failure as practicality outweighed the efficient operation of the service. Therefore, the potential to expand international train operations between Britain and Europe beyond the Channel Tunnel has been limited, made worse by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic during 2020, which saw many intermediate stations, such as Ebbsfleet and Ashford, removed from schedules and not destined to return until at least 2025. Furthermore, ancillary operations to locations outside the core London-Paris-Brussels service have been slowly axed with trains to Avignon and the French Riviera at Marseille being quietly dropped, alongside the once extremely popular Disneyland service. The only notable addition to the Eurostar network was the arrival of the Amsterdam train in April 2018, which initially started as a one-way operation due to a lack of security and customs infrastructure at Amsterdam Central, with Eurostar sets running empty back to Brussels before resuming regular cross-channel service. Amsterdam being made a return stop in October 2020 once the required customs infrastructure had been installed and operates three times per day. To summarise, international train travel for those outside the London and South East regions of England remains an uncompetitive prospect, though the controversial High Speed 2 seeks to redress the balance somewhat through the creation of a long-delayed high-speed corridor to northern England. Unfortunately, cutbacks to the proposed network including the axing of the Phase 2 scheme north of Birmingham, 
thus issuing the major traffic generators of Manchester, Leeds and the East Midlands, as well as the abandonment of an international cord connecting this route to high-speed one in the Channel Tunnel, means the business case and justification for this mega-project has courted significant scrutiny. Therefore, until such time that a dedicated high-speed railway connecting the regions of England, Wales and Scotland with the Channel Tunnel can be provided, low-cost airlines will continue to rule international travel between Britain and Europe without viable competition, largely cutting off the UK from the ever-expanding high-speed rail network of the near continent, which continues to shrink journey times and bring the capitals of their respective nations closer together.